Yo, what's going on snipers and welcome back to our National Predators Throwback 2000 franchise mode here in NHL 24. So in last episode we simulated more of the season and this has been a historically bad season for this National Predators team. We are 10-47-8-1 on the season and it has been absolutely dreadful. Obviously it's because of the fact that we hired some bad coaches to make us tank for the top pick this year. I'm still a little bit scared that there might be some repercussions where some players start to drop off and stuff like that because these coaches, like, I'm a little bit concerned about that. However, it's been kind of fun to watch this team not do so well because, like, it seem, almost seems like a draft to glory team when you look at, like, the plus minuses throughout a roster. You can see the lowest, uh, best plus minus on the team that's played all games so far this season, or most games, I should say, is a minus 12. The worst on the team is Scratchins and Hal Gill, who are a minus 71 each, which is absolutely insane. So it's been a very weird season, uh, considering obviously last year we made the playoffs and just to like basically change the coaching staff, and that's pretty much it, and also make some off-season adjustments. Our team has fallen off completely, and our goaltending really hasn't been that good either. There has been a lot of morale problems with this roster at the moment, so I'm a little bit scared, like I said, that players could start to drop off in potential because of the coaches. Uh, so in the offseason, i got to definitely remember to fire these coaches because or else it could be very devastating to the progress of a lot of these young guys. As you can see, if we go to this roster, you can see right now on the side, we have a 35% locker room chemistry. And you can see all these guys on the team are disgruntled, which is not great. I don't like that Ladislav Nagy's disgruntled because he's a future piece of this team. Uh, but guys like Kimo Timonen are disgruntled. Uh, Steve Sullivan's disgruntled, which is not great. Like a lot of the kind of guys I would think about flipping away in this episode are a bit disgruntled or disengaged, which is not great. So... Um, I probably will trade away a few of these guys in this episode. So like Thomas Vokun maybe gets flipped away. I'm not too sure, but he's definitely not too happy here. Uh, Kimo Timonen, he being disengaged and signed to a two-year deal. I think obviously we should probably think about trying to flip him away in this episode too. And then the last one I was thinking about flipping away is probably also Scott Walker because he is also currently disengaged. So if I get rid of those three guys, uh, the rest of the players, hopefully once we get good coaches again next year, they get back up there and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, this has just not uh, been exactly how I have planned the morale on this roster because compared to, this, uh, to uh, the AHL at the moment, you can see our HL team is a 79% locker room chemistry. We actually even have two leaders in the locker room down there in the HL, including Nathan Robinson and the Solovyov guy. And then everybody on this team actually has some pretty good morale, except for Di Pietro because he was sent down from the NHL to the HL. But I'm hoping that obviously him playing on a good HL team will help his morale get back to where it was because obviously having Di Pietro a little bit pissed off is not what we really want considering he's a future starting goalie maybe for this team or a future backup if Sedin develops well enough. So uh, yeah, we are definitely going to have to make some interesting decisions in this episode via trade and see what our team looks like. Uh, for the rest of the season and simulate the rest of it and see if this team uh, falls off even more so if people actually start to get a little bit happier or not and then who knows what's going to happen in the off season our players going to not want to resign with her team after what happened with this season that type of thing but anyways before we get into the 2003 draft let's get into your guys' comments and see what you guys have to say about last episode and then we will get into this trade deadline and see what we could whip up in terms of trades so the first comment is from San Otago. says, you definitely need defensive prospects in this year's draft. I don't care if they're your players or generated. The highest potential, the better. And uh, yeah, I, do, I totally agree with that. Obviously, we're trying to draft Patrice Bergeron this year, which will help us out defensively quite a bit, considering he's a very good defensive forward. However, in terms of actual defensemen, if we have another top 10 pick, obviously Jalen Regeer is the type of guy we would need over somebody like Marita, Timander, or Burns, just because we need an actual defenseman. Uh, there's some other defenders in this draft, too, that we could easily pick up if uh, we don't have a top five selection. Those being guys like Shea Weber, Brent Seabrook, Dion Phaneuf. Like, at least the 2003 draft has some good defenders in it that we should be able to build up our prospect pool a little bit with some good defenders in it. But, yeah, that's definitely a, uh, a weakness we have on our roster right now uh, that we definitely need. There's also some good goalie options if we want to have better goalie prospects, but I think we already have good enough goalie prospects. It's just more about finding those good defenders and then also some good forwards to help out with the offense a little bit too. 
The next comment is from Michael Dose who says, I'm just hoping these coaches that are bad don't cost young players from growing in the next few seasons. And yeah, that's the one thing, like I said, I was a little bit worried about. I hope that uh, it doesn't come to that. Uh, I don't think a lot of the young guys are losing morale too much. Like, it seems like Jason Spetz is doing okay, but Ladislav Nagy is like one of the ones that I'm not really liking that... Uh, is getting a little bit of morale problems. Scott Hartnell seems to be okay, I think, as well. Yeah, see, like, the, some of these young guys are doing okay in terms of uh, their morale. But uh, then you go to some people like Ladislav Nagy. He was still not uh, too happy with, like, how the team has been performing, how he's been performing. So, uh, yeah, we definitely need to uh, probably get rid of those coaches as soon as the offseason hits because or else we could risk uh, stunting the growth of a lot of our prospects, and that will make our rebuild only a lot longer. In the last and final comment is from Jared DeRabbit who says, Jesse Wanvig, no thanks, I'd rather have him named Yernej Wolski. If I had things my way, Stefan Marita would be Stefan Moser. So he's still uh, talking about the uh, region-specific names, how inaccurate they are. And I know, I know it's really annoying. I don't know if EA is ever going to fix it, but hopefully they do because obviously it, it kind of, I, I don't say it breaks the uh, immersion experience for me personally, but I know for some people, obviously, if you see like a name that doesn't make sense, like, let's just go down here, we'll find one. There's the Wanvig guy. Obviously, that doesn't really make sense because the uh, player that played in the NHL, Kyle Wanvig, he was a Canadian. Jesse Wanvig is not a, a name for a Polish player, obviously, because Poland I don't think there's any people in Poland. Maybe there is people in Poland named Jesse, but they probably have like an actual different name to it. Wanvig is not a Polish last name, so it just, I don't understand why EA doesn't necessarily have like a list of Polish last names that go into the Polish region or into different European regions, that type of thing. So hopefully that's something that they address at some stage, but if not, it doesn't break my immersion, but I know it does break the immersion for a couple of you guys out there as well. But anyways, there's that. Let's get into this trade deadline and see what ends up happening. Also, I'm kind of interested to see what the AI does in terms of trades as I am per usual. So let's uh, hop into this and see what we could do. So we're gonna go as a seller and we're gonna see what we could get for some of these type of guys that we're thinking about trading away. So. Uh, let's first go to find trade. Rick DiPietro is gaining some morale. That's good to see. Uh, but I don't know if I will trade Vokun yet. I feel like Vokun's value is not very good even, which kind of sucks because we have him locked up for two more years. But I might honestly have to just wait till next season to flip him or the off season. Uh, the ones, though, that I was thinking about trading away for sure is like somebody like Kimo Timonen. Uh, and then also I was leaning towards Scott Walker for sure as well. A lot of these other guys I might wait till the offseason on. Like Greg Johnson, I'll probably end up holding on to. There's already been a trade at this deadline. Damn, I'm not going to look through the bottom trades for now. I'm going to wait until we actually get out of this trade deadline. But let's uh, see what Kimo Timonen can fetch us on an open block. Two second round picks really isn't that bad in this universe because a lot of teams don't really like giving up first round picks. Carolina's willing to give me two seconds. Two seconds in Yannick Tremblay. <laughs> no, thank you. Don't want Yannick Tremblay on that contract. Turco, a third and a fourth. Radic Dvorak's not bad, but I don't want Patrick Laleem. Trevor Daly in a second. Mmm. You know, Ottawa, that might be actually a thing I'm willing to do, because Trevor Daly, decent defensive prospect. And we also get a second round pick. Let's see, Trevor Daly. 73 at 19 as well. I don't mind that. Yeah, I think that would be a good move for our team to make, because we need defensive prospects. Trevor Daly is what we're going to bring in. So Timonen is going to be going off to Ottawa. I know I didn't want to flip him necessarily yet. He's a great defenseman. He's actually listed as a top two. But we might as well trade him and give him to a team that actually could use him. So welcome aboard to Trevor Daly in a second round pick. Kimo Timonen is off to the Ottawa Senators. So he gets dealt a little bit early, but I think it makes sense for our team to do that at this stage. And then Scott Walker is the last one I was thinking about potentially trading as well. There's some other players I could trade, but I don't know. <laughs> I could literally just trade him for Chris Simon in a third, so that way I'm getting a roster player back, and then we're freeing up that cap space in the offseason. Not that there's a salary cap anyways, and I don't really want Chris Simon. Even though Chris Simon, prototypical power forward, not a bad player. Rest in peace to him, but I don't think I want, uh, want him on the roster right now. And an open block rise or fine trade wise doesn't show anything. Hmm. Scott Walker is going to be hard to move because he's got a little bit of a long-term contract. I should just see who's interested in him, and then maybe we could find some other deals. Um, Anaheim's interested. I want to see if there's a team that actually makes logical sense to take him in, though. 
because I know Anaheim obviously with Solani, they don't really have the use for him. Like he'd be like a third line right wing. So that doesn't really make sense in my opinion. Uh, the Coyotes, do they have any use for him? Not really either. They have some good right wing depth. Atlanta, I wouldn't trade him to because Atlanta's not doing well. So I don't think it makes sense for Atlanta to uh, bring in a good player like Scott Walker. The Boston Bruins, let's see about them. No use really either. Buffalo, does Buffalo have use on the right side? Not really. Looks like they brought in Radic Dvorak from the Rangers because I'm pretty sure he was there at the start of this episode. So shout out to Radic Dvorak going off to Buffalo. Calgary maybe has interest. They have already Jerome McGinley though and Bure. Like, mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think Ed Jovanovsky just got traded to Montreal. Huh, interesting. Carolina has interest in Scott Walker, which is obviously where he was. They can use him, but they would knock down Lang and Brunner further than the lineup, but that's okay. That's okay, I think. Uh, what do you have that you could give me, potentially? Do you have, like, a future second rounder? That's actually, I could get a future first, maybe, for Scott Walker. I feel like that's a bit of a reach, though. Edmonton's making some moves, apparently. Uh, can I get a future first round pick for Scott Walker? I know this is a far-fetched offer, but can I get a future first? <laughs> okay, well, I, I might have made an unrealistic trade. I don't know, but I got a first round pick for Scott Walker. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take that. And Carolina immediately put Scott Walker back on the block. What is the realism in that? That's very strange. That's very strange. Why would you give me your first round pick and immediately throw the guy on the block? Like, they're not going to get a first-round pick back for him, probably, at this stage. So I might have screwed Carolina over. I might have screwed them over out of a good pick. Who knows how good that pick's going to be, because that's going to be a generated draft class. That's the year after this, I think. So, hmm. All right. So I think that might be all we need to do in terms of trades, is just trade on Wally Walker and Teeman. And trying to think of if there's anybody else I would trade. Greg Johnson I'm okay with having. Fitzgerald's a pending UFA, but I would honestly like to keep him here. He's our captain right now. Might as well just hold on to him a little bit longer. Uh, nobody on the left side. Sullivan, I wouldn't want to trade away. He is losing morale, but I think he'll be okay for a few more years. Defensively, um, we could trade away like Warren or Wilson. They're pending UFAs as well, but we need bodies. So I don't think I want to do that. Um, that's six defensemen. We probably could use a seventh defenseman on this team right now, but oh well. Goalie wise, do I want to trade Vokun right now? Like, what can I get for Thomas Vokun if I go to fine trade? Like, is his value still very low? Because if his value is still very low, I might just hold on to him for a bit until, like, the draft or something. A fourth round pick isn't bad, but I honestly don't know if I want Deep Pietro getting called up to a roster that's doing so bad again. Like, it might be just worth holding on to Vokun a little bit longer. Yeah, I think I'm going to hold on to Thomas Vokun until the offseason at least, and then we could decide just because Di Pietro coming onto this roster, he will do crap again, his morale will go down. I'd rather have Chris Mason and Vokun take the fault for it, and then Di Pietro could come up to a team that's actually doing better next season or something like that. So I think that's all we're going to make in terms of trades this year. So we're going to back out of this, and we'll see what we got in terms of deadline deals. That means Kimo Timonen is going to have to be removed off my thumbnail now, or he's going to be put in black and white at least. So there is uh, the one of the first big trades. I did see that Yannick Trouble was dealt, but this is one of the first trades of the deadline. Was Wisniewski a second and Yannick Trouble going to Carolina for Jeff O'Neill, Andy Delmore, and Gary Roberts. So that's a pretty substantial trade. The Islanders bringing in a lot of good players, uh, and they give up a prospect. They give up a top four defenseman-ish and a second round pick. So Carolina is looking like they're, I don't know exactly what they're doing. I feel like they're building for the future with bringing in that second round pick in Wisniewski, but bringing in Yannick Tremblay, huh. I wonder if that was just more for cap reasons, even though there's technically no salary cap. Hmm. Because why would Carolina give me their first round pick for next year if they're basically offloading their veteran players? I don't understand the logic on that, but it is what it is. Uh, Jamie Heward is on waivers. He actually played with the National Predators at one point. Do I need Jamie Heward? We could use another defenseman. I did say that. I did say we need another defenseman. He's been playing in Washington like he actually was in real life. Looks like Florida must have claimed him recently. 
Huh, you know what? I might actually claim Jamie Heward, so that way we have seven defensemen because we did just trade away Kimo Timonen. So you know what? We're going to actually claim G uh, Jamie Heward. He's only signed for one year. Might as well claim him just to give us some more depth in case. So there is the trade deadline. Now the question is what trades happened at the 2003 deadline. Did there any crazy trades other than that one that we just saw? Let's see what we got in here. So Washington has acquired Trevor Kidd in a third for a fourth round pick, a sixth round pick, and two others. The New York Islanders acquire a third, Glenn Metropolitan and Brian Pothier from the Kings for a second, and some guy named Jonas Watkins, or Jonas Watkins probably. Boston has acquired Jamie Storr in a third round pick and Tyler Wright from the LA Kings for a second, and some guy named Joe Aikson, who's a goalie, I guess. Boston's acquired Philip Kuba a fifth and a sixth from Calgary for a third and a third, so Boston doing a couple deals here at the deadline. Uh, Calgary's acquired a third and a third. Actually, wait, no, that's another same trade. Never mind. <laughs> St. Louis has acquired a third anti Niemi in a seventh from Pittsburgh for a third, a fourth, and two others. So anti Niemi off to the St. Louis Blues. Uh, the LA Kings have acquired a third, a fourth, and two others for a third at Wayne Primo and Doug Smolik, who head to Anaheim. So Anaheim loading up a little bit. Atlanta has acquired a second, a third from Edmonton for Espen Knutson, a fourth, and Bill McCult. Shout out to Bill McColt. San Jose has acquired Francois Boschman and Mike Smith from Montreal for Vincent Domfus, who returns to the team that he won the Stanley Cup with in 1993. So that's actually pretty damn cool. Uh, obviously, we did see that Montreal had Cristobal Huey and Mike Smith in like the minors, so to speak. So Mike Smith is gone from there now. So maybe Cristobal Huey is the future goaltender for the Montreal Canadiens. I also offload Francois Boschman to a different California team, not the Ducks. And then Vincent Donfoust returns to probably, I would say, his home, basically. Even though technically he did play in Toronto, Edmonton, some other teams. I would say Montreal is definitely the home for Vincent Donfoust. Uh, Colorado has acquired Peter Schaefer, a fourth, and Gary Galley from Vancouver for a second and a fourth. So Vancouver continuing to do what they've been doing in the series and offload a lot of roster players. Atlanta has acquired a second and Doug Janik from Buffalo for Jonas Hoagland, Damian Rhodes, and Steve Steos. I'm kind of surprised that Doug Janik in a second would fetch that much players, but I'm not going to question it. Vancouver, Vancouver's acquired two second round picks that are still offloading a lot of players for Andrew Castles. So another Donamo, or not Donamo, what am I saying? Domino, not Donamo. <laughs> Domino has fallen in Vancouver as Andrew Castles is gone. It's actually kind of insane how much uh, deals Vancouver's made to start the series. Uh, Pittsburgh has acquired Dan Kluche a third and Yaroslav Svechkovsky who is actually an assistant coach of the Vancouver Canucks, I believe, right now, or their AHL team, one of the two. Uh, Tampa Bay gets UC Jokin and Nick Schultz and Sean Burke. So that's an interesting deal. So both goalies flipping uh, locations, and then uh, Tampa's getting a couple good prospects. They give up on Svechkovsky a little bit early, even though he's not really that great anyways. He was a former first-round pick of the Washington Capitals, so... Uh, St. Louis getting a third, a fourth, and Garth Snow from Dallas for a third and a third. Okay, so Garth Snow off to the Blues, which is not great considering we have the Blues first round pick. Uh, the Islanders acquired Jan Halavich from the Rangers for a fourth, a fifth, and two others. So Jan Halavich just going not too far away from where he was playing. The Detroit Red Wings have acquired Ron Francis and Darby Hendrickson for a second, a third, and some guy named Byron. Jeez, I feel like Detroit, even though they have a great roster, they just keep loading up on Hall of Fame talent. Because they had last year Doug Gilmore. Now they have Ron Francis. That's insane. And Detroit and Carolina making this trade a year after they technically would have faced each other in the cup finals. Even though that didn't happen in this series, technically this is 0203, And obviously they faced each other in 0 uh, the New Jersey Devils have acquired Todd White, Chris Terrian, and Mark Denis from the Tampa Bay Lightning for a third, a fourth, and some guy named Party. So... New Jersey getting some more depth to their roster. And then obviously there's our trade with Scott Walker. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes have traded Joffrey Lupul, or have acquired Joffrey Lupul, Macarine, and Giuliano from the Edmonton Oilers for Ruslan Soleil, Kent Vanderville, and Bates Bataglia. So Carolina and Edmonton making a trade a few years earlier than they would have faced each other in the cup finals in real life. So another interesting deal right there. Montreal does acquire Ed Jovanovski from Vancouver for a second round pick and a fourth round pick. Damn, Jovanovski only fetched in a second and a fourth. That's not that bad. So Vancouver is, uh, yeah, still just offloading everybody on the roster. 
The Rangers have acquired Chris Higgins, a second and a fifth from Buffalo for Roddick, Dvorak, and Brian Leach. So Buffalo owning up, they get a good forward in Dvorak, who's still relatively young, and they get an old Brian Leach. Rangers getting Chris Higgins a little bit early because I think he actually played there briefly. The LA Kings get a third, a third, and some guy named Astles for Craig Johnson and Dalton Brashear. So I don't know what uh, Milbury's doing in there in New York, but he brings in some grit, I would say, because Craig Johnson, more of a two-way forward, and then Dalton Brashear, obviously, a little bit more of an enforcer. There's our Trevor Daly deal. Mike Dunham got dealt again. Goddamn. Mike Dunham goes gets dealt so much. Uh, Mike Dunham, a third, and some guy named Osgood going to the Dallas Stars. Philadelphia gets Darian Hatcher and Darren McCarty. So Darian Hatcher going to the Philadelphia Flyers a little bit earlier than I think he actually did because this technically would have been the season, I believe. Or actually, no, he would have been still in Dallas at this time, right? Yeah, I think he still would have been in Dallas. 2003-04, he was with Detroit. Then he got bought out. And then 2005-06 and such, he was with the Philadelphia Flyers. But still, that's kind of neat. And then the first trade, we already saw that one. Or the second trade, we already saw that one. And then Jason Woolley, Sergey Breland, and Andy Sutton getting dealt to Anaheim for a second. And Paul Ranger. So Andy Sutton going to the Ducks way in advance. Like seven plus years in advance. So that's kind of neat. So there is the trade deadline for 2002-03. A little bit of a busy one. Some interesting deals for sure. Now let's simulate the rest of the season. Let me actually make sure our lines are okay though. Because obviously it should have probably adjusted my lines accordingly. Let's go with Arkipov up there over a bead. Make sure our young guys are getting prioritized. Uh, hmm. Let's get Spets on the second line here. Just rework this a little bit. Just to make sure we're getting our young guys as much as possible here. Uh, let's go with that. I don't really care too much. But obviously, I want to make sure everybody's happy on this team as much as possible. Hopefully, we don't have any injuries to deal with. Um, yeah, that's all good, I think. Yep, we are good to simulate. So we'll see what ends up happening the rest of the season. See where we're drafting for next year. See if the AHL team could maybe go for a run because they are at least making the playoffs right now. 28-24, 9-2. They could still miss, but they are definitely doing better than our NHL team at the moment. Okay. So how much more wins do we think we're going to have the rest of the season? I'm going to say maybe two or three. Considering we've only won 10 games this entire year, if we win more than five games, I'll be surprised. So let's go to the end of March and see how we do. After this trade deadline, we should do bad considering we just offloaded our best defenseman and one of our best forwards. And yeah, we're still losing a lot of games, which is good. But also, hopefully the young guys are doing okay. Uh, but yeah, we're going to definitely need to fire these coaches before uh, it's too late or else these guys are not going to be very happy going forward there's our first win in quite a while a 2-1 win over Arizona who's in a playoff spot I think at the moment it's kind of crazy so we only got one win in that month let's go through our last four games OT loss there so it's a not a point technically there's a win over Washington and a loss to Detroit to end the season so we finished our year 12, 59, 8, and 3, which means we've guaranteed the odds, I'm pretty sure, to potentially get Patrice Bergeron. But will the draft lottery be in our favor? Probably not. Because you just never win a draft lottery, it seems like, when you have the best odds. But you never know. Okay, let's make sure the AI teams are done their season as well. St. Louis has missed the playoffs, so that's good for us. I don't know how high of a pick it's going to be, but at least that's good for us. Let's take a look at the standings. So, entire league-wise, the Philadelphia Flyers have won the President's Trophy with 118 points. And, yeah, we were the worst team by quite a large margin. And the St. Louis Blues went all the way up to 21st. So, we have a top 10 pick, likely. There's an, uh, a chance they could fall into the top 5 still, but it's definitely very slim. But there is a chance we could still win the lottery with that selection from St. Louis. Now, the question is, did Edmonton make the playoffs? I think they did, right? Yeah, Edmonton was the fifth best team in the NHL. So, unfortunately, that first rounder is going to be quite late. But at least uh, it's another first round pick for our roster. So, that's good. Uh, let's take a look at some of our fun stats here. So, in terms of goals four per game, we should be up. We were the worst offensive team. We were also the worst defensive team. Our power play was not the worst in the league still, which is kind of a surprise based on our offense. 
and our penalty kill was the worst in the league. So pretty much stayed the same as it was in the last episode. We are 532-3-1 on home ice, 727-5-2 on the road. Hmm. Pretty damn bad. Did our AHL team clinch the playoff spot yet? Yes, they did. They clinched actually their division. So shout out to Milwaukee. We'll see if they end up winning a Calder Cup or not. That's uh, very promising, at least for the future of this roster. Let's take a look at some NHL stats here. Oh my goodness, the plus minuses. Uh, Greg Johnson, 62 points, but minus 48. Tom Fitzgerald, 41 points, minus 56. Jeez, man. Spets on 32 points in his rookie season. I'll take that. Obviously, the minus 40 sucks, but he uh, at least picked up 19 goals and 32 points. So that's good. Leg one also on 32 points. And everybody else was 10 and below, or 11 and below, I should say. Yeah, I'm uh, curious on the plus minus of Hal Gill. Is he a plus or minus 100 on the season or something like that, based on how he was at the halfway point or whatever point we were at? Nagy on 48 points, he was pretty good. Minus 40 sucks, but it is what it is. Scott Hartnell on 36 points. At least some of the young guys were producing on a good level, so that's a positive too. Sullivan on 36 points only. Eh, that's not really as much as I was hoping for. Yeah, last year he had 79 points. So a big drop-off year for Steve Sullivan. But obviously, I think uh, if the team's roster was better around him, he should do better. I think. He might have to get traded away at some point. Erat only 21 points isn't bad, but it's not great either. Cesar, 2 points in 23 games. Defensively. Scratchdens was a minus 84. Hal Gill was a minus 91. The worst plus minuses I'd seen on a non-draft glory team. That's insane. And then you had also Rhett Warner with 15 points, minus 53. But shout out to Mike Wilson for only being a minus 23 and Paul Louse for only being a minus 21. Then again, Paul Louse was in the box a lot, so that probably helped him a lot. Wilson was out there a lot because he only had 12 penalty minutes. Goaltending-wise, what do we got here? Thomas Vokun had an 8.93 and a 4.17 goals against. Yeah, we might have to think about trading Vokun next episode. And then Mason was uh, the better of the two options, but still he's not very good either. So, yikes. Let's uh, take also a quick look at our HL team before we take a look at the entire NHL. Adam Hall led the way with 66 points. Okay. That's good to see. A lot of pluses on this team too. Only a couple minuses. Uh, Mark Morrow had 40 assists but no goals. So shout out to Mark Morrow. And goalie-wise, Rick DiPietro was really solid since getting sent down. And Dan Ellis did his job too. So shout out to the Milwaukee Admirals. Hopefully they have a good playoff run ahead of them. Let's take a look at the entire league for the NHL. What do we got here? 124 points from Burnaby Joe at 33 years old. Crazy season for him. Solani behind him with 117. John LeClaire 112. Everybody else was 109 or less. But still a lot of 100-point players this season. And then goal scoring. Joe Sackick, 68 goals, beating out Pavel Bray, who had 66. So only two 60-goal scorers, but you also had a couple 50-goal scorers like Solani, Korea, Yager, and Kachuk. Peter Bondra and a lot of other guys just missing out. Hmm. So there's that. Best, uh, let's take a look at some shorthanded goals and stuff like that. So game-winning goals, Joe Sackick, then Yager. Power play goals, Pavel Bray had 28 power play goals. My God. Uh, short-handed goal, Sergei Zoltok. Most short-handed points, Sean McEachern, as well as Todd Marchant. Makes sense. Most hits for fun as a forward, Darcy Tucker with 237 and an Owen Nolan with 227. Jeez. Scott Walker had 216. How much did he points did he finish off with on the season? Oh, he only had four assists in 18 games with Carolina after we dealt him there. Yikes. And you gave me a first-round pick for him? I, I feel like I completely fleeced them. And I didn't even want to do it like that, but they were willing to give it to me. So, uh, most takeaways Daniel Elfertson. Okay. So, Selkie candidate wise, it's probably going to be Pierre Turgeon. Yeah, it's probably going to be Pierre Turgeon that wins the Selkie. Most fights Matthew Barnaby, 26. And then that Jitter guy that went first overall had 24 fights in his first season. So, shout out to Lorenzo Jenner. That might be the most aggressive first round, uh, first overall pick I've seen. All right, 
Best defenseman this season. Yanni Ninema with 83 points is likely going to be your Norris winner unless they give it to Nick Lidstrom because of the plus minus or Oleg Tavardovsky or even Eric Desjardins because he was a plus 54. Hmm. So some good options out there, but Yanni Ninema might be a Norris winner, which is pretty crazy. He got injured in the last game of the season. That's very unfortunate for the Oilers, but it is good for us because we have their first round pick. Goalie-wise, the most wins, 43 from Patrick Waugh. Most shutouts, Patrick Waugh with 8. Best save percentage by a starter, Curtis Joseph with a 9.15. And best goals against average by a starter, Evgeny Nabokov with a 2.55. All right. Any goalie goals this season? No goalie goals, most assists. Six assists from Roman Turek, which doubled Fred Brathwaite. Damn. Roman Turek, assist machine. And best rookie of this season in terms of points, Lorenzo Jenner. There's a chance to have Lorenzo Jenner is going to likely win the Calder over Rick Nash. And yeah, Lorenzo Jenner having that much penalty minutes and stuff too, and fights. That guy's insane. Him and Alex Hemsky up there for the Atlanta Thrashers. So there is that. And now the question is, what is the playoff bracket looking like and who's going to win the Stanley Cup in 2003? Do we have both teams that were actually in the 03 Stanley Cup Finals in the playoffs this year? I feel like we should, right? I got to double check that, though. So, uh, Anaheim is in the playoffs. Is New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey likely is, right? Yeah, they are. Okay. So, there is a chance we could get the actual Cup Finals, which is cool. Let me show you guys what the bracket's looking like on this part instead. Philadelphia is apparently the favorite this year. So you have Colorado, Dallas, Detroit in Phoenix, Anaheim in LA, Edmonton, San Jose, Philadelphia, New York, as in the Islanders, Florida, New Jersey, Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa, Pittsburgh. All right, so Pittsburgh in the playoffs is interesting considering technically at this time they weren't really that good. But who's going to win the Stanley Cup in 2003? Are we going to get a realistic result? Let's find out. Did Milwaukee already get eliminated? Because uh, we have not got a notification that they're on to the next round. Yep, they already got eliminated. So that actually kind of sucks, considering I thought they were going to have a good little run. But Milwaukee already gone from the AHL playoffs just like that. Who is going to be the Stanley Cup champion 03? The Florida Panthers have pulled off the back-to-back. Because -back, I'm pretty sure they won last year. They brought in Patrick Elias, Theo Fleury in the offseason. And Florida getting it done again. Damn. Pavel Bure is a two-time Stanley Cup champion. And Cleveland Lumberjacks win the Calder Cup, so shout out to Cleveland. But Florida winning another Stanley Cup in this universe. Wow. So that's uh, unrealistic, but it doesn't really matter too much. I'll take it. This is technically Tampa winning the Stanley Cup, I would say, a year early again. Who did they beat this year in the Cup Finals? The San Jose Sharks got to the Cup Finals in 03. We weren't really that close to having a realistic cup finals because New Jersey was knocked out in the first round by the Florida Panthers who went on to win the Stanley Cup. And Anaheim was knocked out in the second round by the Detroit Red Wings. Hmm. No worries. No worries on that. Let's take a look at that Florida Panthers Stanley Cup team. See if uh, they just completely dominated, which more than likely they did. So in terms of Fords, this is their Ford group. Kozlov had 30 points. Patrick Elias, obviously, like I just said, was brought in via free agency. 28 points this year from him in the playoffs. Bure on 25. Yeah, this is a really good team. Like Their top six was fantastic. Their bottom six, not as crazy, but still their top six did its job. Defensively, Dan Boyle was their leading point getter on defense, which is kind of weird. So they're not getting a lot of points from their back end. And then their goaltending... Tommy Salo picked up a 930 save percentage. And then Lundqvist played a game and had a 950. I thought their backup was Trevor Kidd, but Trevor Kidd got dealt. So Lundqvist, wow, he developed really quick. He developed way quicker than anticipated. As I made him like a 50-something, I thought, overall-wise. But he's a 79 already. And he only played 10 games in the regular season after Trevor Kidd got dealt. And then he came in the playoffs and played one playoff game. But he's a Stanley Cup champion in this rookie season. So, shout out to Henrik Lundqvist for getting a Stanley Cup that he never got. So, there's the Florida Panthers and their Cup winning team. Let's take a look at these awards to wrap up the season. So, Florida pulling off the first back-to-back. -back. Will they win another next year? There's a chance if they have Henrik Lundqvist uh, between the pipes. Philadelphia won the President's Trophy. Florida, obviously, the Stanley Cup like we just saw. Individual awards, Joe Sackick, the Art Ross Trophy winner. 
the heart also going to Joe Sackick. Eric Dar Desjardins did win the Norris because of that plus minus. So shout out to Eric Desjardins, who never won a Norris in his actual career, but definitely was an underrated defenseman in his time. Joe Sackick, the Lady Bing. Ryan Malone won the Calder this year. So it didn't go to Lorenzo Jenner or any of those guys. It went to Ryan Malone probably based on plus minus. But Ryan Malone, a Calder winner. That's kind of weird. Didn't he actually come close to winning the Calder in real life? I feel like he did, actually. It seems like a weird stat, but I feel like he actually did. I need to take a look at that, though. Maybe not. I may be completely wrong with this, but I definitely need to check now. Because I remember else I'm going to second-guess myself. He was uh, an all-rookie team in 2003-04. He finished fifth in Calder votes in 2003-04, so somewhat close. Somewhat close. I'll take it. Uh, Victor Kozlov got the con Smythe this year. Last year was Ray Whitney. Nabokov wins a Vesna. So shout out to Evgeny Nabokov. Patrick Wall won the Jennings. Rhett Warner won the Bill Masterton for us because he was tragic defensively. LA's head coach winning a Jack Adams. Who was LA's head coach in 2002 or 3? Uh, is it Tim Murray or something like that, my guess? I don't really know who honestly was the coach at this point for the LA Kings. It was Andy Murray. Uh, that's the Murray I meant to actually. Yeah, Andy Murray. I think that's the Murray I was thinking of. So I was somewhat close. <laughs> Sergey Fedorov wants the Selkie. Sackick the Lindsay. And also the Richard, too, for him. AHL wise, Steven Reinprecht won an award. Chris Herberger. Uh, some guy named Moro. Brad Boys. Brad Boys won the Rookie of the Year. Dave Ellett down there. Cristobal Huey was actually doing some good job down there, too. Maybe he'll be in the NHL bound next season. Brandon Convery uh, and some guy, guy named Sontang. All right. Oh, I wanted to go back to NHL, but it will. Okay, now the question is, where are we going to be drafting in the Stack 2003 draft class? And uh, what is this draft class fully looking like? All that type of thing. Where are we drafting? We have two lottery picks. Ah, uh, and of course, it had to be this way. And I don't think we're moving up to number one to get Patrice Bergeron because of this. The Boston Bruins have won the Patrice Bergeron sweepstakes. It had to be this way. It had to be this way. I think uh, I think this is okay for me now. That it's kind of realistic at least. We fall to two, which means we can draft one of those forwards. Or we go with that defenseman because we do need defense prospects. And then we do get the ninth overall pick from the St. Louis Blues because we fall back with that one as well. Hypothetically, we could move up to get Bergeron, but don't you guys want to see Bergeron in Boston like he actually should be? Because I honestly think he should stay there. We could always try and get ourselves two really good players still with those picks. Like, two and nine is still great. I'll still take it, but obviously falling back kind of sucks, but at least it's to the Boston Bruins. Huh, that's actually kind of insane. I didn't even realize Boston was in that spot to potentially get Patrice Bergeron, so shout out to this game for doing something cool for a change. All right, so retirements, Doug Gilmore has retired at 39 years old. So salute to Doug Gilmore, one of the better players in NHL history, or one of the underrated players, I should say. Uh, Sergei Nemchinov, also pretty solid, with 101 points. That's not bad for him. He's 40 years old. Tony Herkic retires too. Benoit Hogue, some other guys. Uh, Valerie Kamensky is retired. Same with Dave Reed. Wendell Clark hangs them up. Mikhail Anderson, Kevin Stevens. Jeff Daniels at 34. That's kind of a little bit earlier than anticipated. Right side of things, Scott, uh, not Scott Thomas, Steve Thomas. 262 points. He retires at 39. All right. Ulf Dahlin retires as well. John McClain. Rick Tockett. Will he become a head coach in this universe? And Doug Brown, as well as Ty Domi, who was a free agent, apparently, and Kelly Buckberger. So a couple face punchers. Defensively, the best defenseman to retire this season was Gary Suter in Toronto. Scott Stevens also retires in Vancouver, which is kind of hilarious. Frederick Olson retires. Gord Murphy, Bill Holder, Eric Weinrich, Dave Manson. Damn, Ole Samuelson retires, so shout to San Otaku. He was probably very happy that he retired. James Patrick retires. Dave Ellett. Mark Bershevin. Will he become the general manager of the Montreal Canadiens in this universe? Joe Rieke retires. Adam Burt. Peter Popovic retires. Murray Barron. Christopher Olsen, who was traded once for Pavel Dimitra. I don't know why the Sens traded Pavel Dimitra to get Christopher Olsen, but I'm not going to complain about former things. Francis Kucera also retires after three games. Goaltending-wise, John Van Beesbrook retires in Edmonton, as does Tom Barrasso. 
Uh, Craig Billington retires at 36, Chris Terreri at 39, and Billy Ranford at 37 years old. Will any of these guys become coaches or scouts? No, I guess not. In terms of coach retirement-wise, did we lose anybody? Did we lose anybody? Looks like no. Looks like no. Yep. Hmm. Good. So there's the coach retirements. We'll continue simulating on that. And let's now take a look at like the progress reports, the contract situation, and a draft class, and then I'll be it for this episode because I've already been recording for 40 minutes. Let's see these progress reports. See if we got any good growth from some guys in the system. Brooks Orpik is up to a 76. He's actually listed as a depth defenseman, so he might be NHL bound next year. Uh, Ladislav Nagy getting some statistical looks like, but he still listed as a third scoring forward. Spets up to an 83. So shout out to Jason Spets with some statistical growth, but that's good to see, at least considering when he was unsigned, he didn't grow at all. Greg Johnson on some statistical. Tom Fitzgerald's dropping off. Uh, he's a pending UFA too, so I don't know if we bring back Tom again. Obviously, he's our captain. We could bring him back, but we could also just let him retire or find somewhere else to play like Toronto. Uh, Andrew Hutchinson's up to 75. That's not bad, to be honest. Uh, Scott Hernell's up to an 83. Okay, so some young guys are still getting some growth. Looks like Erat's taking a bit of time to develop. Di Pietro in 80. He's definitely an NHL bound next season, which means is Thomas Vokun getting dealt? I honestly don't know. He's an 83. And then that's pretty much it. In terms of in the system, do we have any high overalls down here? 74 for Trevor Daly. Travis Moen up to a 74. Sedin's up to a 74 already. So Marcus Sedin is going to be probably the AHL starter next season, which is exciting. Like I said, he's this version of Pecorine probably. So excited to see what Marcus Sedin does as the AHL starter or backup next season. Huh, okay, so we got some good growth in the AHL, looks like, in, in the system, like Schubert, too, Giordano. Just got to hope that they pan out. So there is that. Let's take a look at the contract situation here briefly. Who's up for renewal this offseason again? Because I honestly don't remember. So the big one is uh, Scott Hartnell in terms of RFAs. He doesn't look like he's going to really develop much based on that contract demand. So I don't really know what we give him in terms of term. You guys can let me know what you think. Uh, then we have a bunch of free agents like Fitzgerald, Warner, Wilson. There's also Jamie Heward, who we technically just claimed off waivers and then didn't play. We could even sign him back if we want. Paul Laos. I feel like we could literally let go of all those guys if we really want to. And in our phase as well, we have Archipov, Cesar. A lot of UFAs in the AHL too. So there is going to be a lot of changeover, it looks like, going into the next season. We'll probably let go of Chris Mason so Sedin could get into the AHL roster, likely. And then we might have to make a decision with Thomas Vokun too next episode. Okay, final thing, the draft class. So we have two in nine, right? Is what I said. Got to double check on that. Yeah, we have two, nine, and 21. And then we have a boatload of seconds, thirds, and uh, our four, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Huh. Second and 21, or nine and 21. Okay, let's take a look at those spots and see what we could potentially draft. Second, tw nine, and 21. Okay. So Bergeron obviously is going to Boston probably. We probably should go for the defenseman because we do need defenders. Like Jalen Regeer looks pretty good. Uh, but if we wanted to go for a forward, there's a gem in Torsten Tamander. It's probably going to be a great goal scorer. There's also Stefan Morita as well who could be pretty good. So as much as we need defensemen, do we go for a forward instead? And then maybe with our other picks, we go for a defender. Because technically with nine... We could get Shea Weber. We could draft Shea Weber and bring him to Nashville. So, I think... Did I make him a medium elite or a high four? I don't remember. Huh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I think we could draft Shea Weber instead of Regeer, and then we could grab ourselves a good sniper, because we do need offense, too. And then after Weber with 21... Um, who is this dude? Wow, this dude looks good, too. NHL ready. Jeez. Blake Zizekas. Power forward, too. Damn. Yeah, this is going to be a great draft class. Uh, 21 with the Oilers pick. We could draft somebody like Louis Erickson, who is the top six, I'm pretty sure. Same with a lot of these other guys like Jeff Carter, Matt Molson. But we need defensive help. So we could draft like Dion Phaneuf late in the first round, too. Or somebody like Brent Seabrook, Matt Carl, Ryan Suter. We could literally draft Suter, Weber, 
and grab ourselves a Ford if we want to in that first round. And I'm not opposed to doing that. And then there's also second rounders that we can potentially draft people like Toby Enstrom or something like that too. So that's good. Let's see if there's any gems in this draft. Uh, just to major. Hmm. But if you guys were to choose a Ford with the top to uh, the, the second overall pick, who do you choose? Marita or Tamander? Tamander's a gem. Marita can play both sides. He's also a year younger. Like, let's compare the two. I would probably lean towards Marita, even though technically Tamander's the gem. Marita's got two A-plus stats. So he could be definitely a high overall, unless it's just because of the quality of my roster. I don't really know. Uh, let's sort by potential, see if there's any guys that might be late round steals. Obviously, we know Flurry's a late round steal. Obviously, Braden Coburn's not going to be high elite. I know that for sure. <laughs> um, Winnex a guaranteed medium elite power forward. Wow, okay. So they gave us a generated power forward that's medium elite in this draft class. That would be great for the fourth round selection or third round selection. Quincy Shaw's a goalie. Let's pin him too, just for potential value. Zizekas is pretty good too, but I honestly would probably rather choose one of the other guys for him over him. Hmm. What about low leads? Any good low lead steals? Because I always love myself some low leads in the sixth round. Plus, Pete McMillan. Maybe. But it doesn't look like there's any guaranteed ones, unfortunately. Huh, yeah. Doesn't look guaranteed. Okay. And yeah, there's a guy named Braden Aginla. We could say the younger brother is Jerome McGinley or something like that. Huh. Yeah, I think I'm leaning towards taking, like, Marita with our second overall pick, even though technically there's that medium elite DFD. Because, obviously, with this draft being as good as it is, we're still probably going to be able to get somebody like Shea Weber and Ryan Suter or Toby Enstrom or Matt Carl. Like, it doesn't make a big difference not taking Regeer early on, I think. And also, medium elite DFDs are not very good. I would prefer medium elite two-way defensemen. So drafting a medium elite DFD, eh, I don't really know too much. Also, why is it only showing, where's Shea Weber? Why is it not showing Shea Weber on defense? I didn't make him a four, did I accidentally somehow? I gotta double check that, because I feel like a dumbass if I did that. Where is Weber? Or am I blind now? Wait, where did Shea Weber go? Did he just disappear? I am actually confused. I gotta go back and check again because I feel like he just disappeared. Unless I'm completely blind, I probably am. Because I've been recording for 47 minutes. Did he disappear randomly now? Oh no, there he is. What the hell? Oh, it's probably because he didn't get scouted at all, right? Oh no, there he is now. I think he wasn't there when we just last looked, but I don't know. But anyways, we could draft Shea Weber and Ryan Suter. Probably if we really want to. So anyways, guys, that's going to do it for this episode of our Nashville Predators Throwback 2000 Franchise Mode. So in next episode, we will take it to the stacked 2003 draft class. We'll also go to the resign stage and start building up this roster to hopefully be good within the next number of years. Obviously, this year was tragic. Now it's all about the youth movement going forward and trying to turn this team into a contender. Uh, not super quick, but obviously building up via the draft and also via trading. So anything down below, and I'll see you guys next time.